LBF campus. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Nirmalya Thakur sir. He's from University of Cincinnati, USA. He's currently affiliated with Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Cincinnati, USA. His research interests include human computer interaction, artificial intelligence, machine learning, internet of things, data sciences, natural language processing. He has authored 29 peer reviewed publication in a combination of a conference paper, journal publications, invited book chapters by working in these interrelated fields. His research is specifically focused on the development of personalized ambient assisted living technology for the future of IoT based intelligent living environments such as smart homes and smart cities. While conducting his research, he had received a total of $33,300 as a funding support. In addition to his research, he has delivered 21 presentations as keynote speaker, invited presentation at different conferences in US, Canada, China, France, Denmark, and Indonesia. He, is, he has served as a reviewer of more than 28 conferences and more than, th more than 300 papers he has reviewed. It's really a pleasure for LBF campus to host you for this webinar, Dr. Nimale. And we are really uh, eager to listen to you about your views about the topic which you have selected for. Please go ahead. And thank you everyone uh, associated with the LBF campus for inviting me for uh, delivering this webinar. And it's an absolute pleasure to be with all of you at this meeting. And to begin with, I'll start sharing my screen and I'll begin with the presentation. So can everyone see my screen? Um, so basically, uh, so this is the topic of my presentation. So um, I'm associated with the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. And today I'm going to be talking about towards emotionally intelligent um, assistive smart homes for health monitoring. And um, so this is going to be the overview of my presentation. Um, I'm going to begin with the concept and necessity uh, of emotional intelligence in smart homes. And then I'm going to give you an overview of effective systems in smart environments. I'll give an, uh, I'll review the recent researches in this field, the shortcomings that exist, the drawbacks need, that need to be addressed, and how we at the University of Cincinnati are taking a holistic approach at the intersection of multiple disciplines to address these limitations. And then um, I'm going to discuss about EIBs systems like emotional intelligence based systems based on human inter human behavior research that we are specifically focusing on at the University of Cincinnati. And finally, I'm going to conclude with applications and scope for future work in this field. So to begin with, what is emotional intelligence How and how do we understand it as human beings? So um, in a broad manner, this terminology can be defined as the capacity to be aware of uh, to be able to control and to be able to express one's emotions, as well as to be able to handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and with empathy. In this context, the ability of handling interpersonal relationships is particularly important when you talk of the field of human computer, human machine, human robot interactions. And this is the specific uh, domain or subdomain that we are focusing on when we build, uh, when we talk of building emotional intelligence in. Um, in the myriad of technology-based or sensor-based or IoT-based devices that we talk of that humans would be interacting with in their technology-laden smart and assisted living environments. We are going to discuss more of that in the, in the next couple of slides. So uh, why do we need emotional intelligence in smart homes? In general, smart homes is being used as a very broad term here. So basically, uh, smart homes of the future would look like technology-laden, IoT-based, pervasive living environments where humans would live, work, and function. The, the concept of smart cities are being adopted at a very fast rate. More intricate interaction between humans and smart systems are taking place in different spheres of life. And these EI-based systems will be able to detect changes in emotional states, mental and emotional well-being of human beings or the users, which would be very essential for building trust, empathy, and user acceptance in different branches of technologies or in different 
different systems or different uh, pervasive units that would be occupying these smart spaces, which humans would be occupying in the near future. So uh, like why are smart homes important and why are we talking so much about smart homes? So when we talk of smart homes, it is important that we uh, understand how smart homes are, uh, how the adoption of smart homes or how, how at a fast rate the entire world civilization is moving towards smart homes. The global urbanization report from a recent survey shows that almost 70% of the world's population is going to be living in smart homes. This includes all geographic locations, counties, and uh, uh, small countries as well. So uh, when we talk of smart homes, it definitely involves one or more technologies. That is why we use the word smart uh, when we talk of the dwelling place or dwelling region of a human being. And when uh, and in this context, it is important that when the normal living or functioning space of a human being becomes smart, people start to trust in technology because people will only accept technology when they are able to trust the technology. And when we talk of trust in technology, it's important that we analyze uh, the trust people have in the common technologies they use on a day-to-day -day basis. This is an infographic which basically talks of the trust in, of people in some of the common technologies people use on a day-to-day -day basis. We have all heard and used Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Google, Dropbox, Instagram, at least one of these um, applications or application-based products um, in, the near, uh, in the recent past. And a recent survey says that an overwhelming majority of the world's population does not trust these technologies. So where, where is the world heading right now? We are inventing, we are developing, and we are creating technologies at a fast pace. But are we actually actually creating those technologies for a better good? Are we actually creating those technologies in a way that the world is accepting these technologies? Are we actually creating these technologies in a way that the world can trust these technologies unless this trust is there in the long run? People are not going to trust the advanced version of these technologies. People are not going to trust the technologies that surround them. People are not going to trust the technologies that surround their living space on a day-to-day -day basis. That's it is absolutely important considering the fact that almost 70% of the world's population is going to live in smart homes, that uh, we develop technologies in a way so that the future of living, functioning, and working environments, when surrounded by technology, there can be seamless uh, and uh, uh, very uh, easy communications between humans and uh, technology, uh, between humans and computers, between humans and machines, and between humans and robots, so that these two entities can live, work, function, and grow in a way that is comfortable, seamless, easy, and uh, simple to each other so that humans, robots, technologies, computers can coexist in the future of smart environments while helping each other and the user experience of human beings increases. By, uh, and this can only ha uh, happen when we increase their trust in technology. Uh, one of the essential ways of increasing trust in technology is to building emotional intelligence in technology. That is why we are spe going to specifically focus on uh, developing emotional intelligence in the future of technologies as far as smart home domains are concerned, uh, as far as today's uh, web, uh, and that is going to be the central fo focus of today's webinar. So this is a very brief overview of the different kinds of smart home related research that are going on in different parts of um, the United States. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the re uh, really interesting research that, uh, that are going on. So I thought of including that as a reference uh, for this webinar. So when we talk of building uh, emotional intelligence, it's important that we understand the concept of effect aware systems and how effect aware systems can play a pivotal role in terms of building emotional intelligence. So we all have come across one or more of these uh, scenarios as depicted on the slide. We, we have been frustrated when our computer does not work as per the expectations. We have been confused when the computer or a specific application on our computer is not giving the desired results. It could be a simulation or it could be a day-to-day -day app that we have used on a regular basis, like a Microsoft Word or a PowerPoint or a Paint or anything like that. And it, we have also 
also been ecstatic. We have celebrated when we have got desired results on our computer by uh, using uh, any Microsoft Office based app or by using any other uh, uh, software related application. So the point of uh, discussing these three emotional states is it's the same computer, it's the same user, but we have depicted different kinds of uh, emotional responses at different times based on the end result, based on the end status or bend, uh, based on the end outcome of any specific task action or uh, uh, or based uh, or based on the uh, result of anything that we are doing so at this point the computer or the system is not able to track these emotional states but when the computer can start tracking these emotional states and when we can extend this uh, tracking of human emotional states to all the smart and uh, intelligent technologies that surround us, we can build an environment where technology can understand humans, where technology can coordinate, interact, and communicate with humans, understanding the human's emotional states, where technology can talk to us just like another human would talk to us. For instance, if we are sad, technology can talk to us in a specific way. If we are confused, technology can talk to us in a specific way. If we are happy, technology can talk to us in a specific way. That is what, how we talk to another human. We talk to a fellow friend. We've talked to a fellow colleague. We are looking to build that in terms of human interactions with technology. And that is why emotional intelligence is absolutely important when we talk of the future of smart homes. Emotional intelligence can serve a wide range of purposes or wide range of applications when it comes to smart home research. For instance, it can perform emotion analysis. That is the, its pivotal role. It can respond to situations and it can improve the mental and emotional well being of individuals. Uh, this is specifically uh, relevant for the increasingly, uh, uh, for the uh, constantly increasingly work. Uh, constantly increasing world's elderly population because many elderly live alone, many in the, uh, elderly have mental and emotional well-being problems. So when technology can adjust, adapt, communicate and interact with humans with a specific focus on increasing the mental and emotional well-being as a specific case, it's going to increase the overall health, well-being of elderly as they age and it's going to contribute towards their independent living. So this is a specific example of a EI-based uh, affect-aware model. A EI-based or, or an emotional intelligence-based affect-aware model primarily consists of three parts, affect recognition, affect interpretation, and affect aware reaction. So what do we mean by affect recognition? It means the use of multiple modes of uh, way, multiple ways to capture the user interaction and to, and to make sense of the emotion that is associated with the user interaction. It can be based on natural language processing as shown in the slide. This recognition can be used by sensor, can be done by sensor technology like an IoT based environment. This can be done by artificial intelligence. This can be done by any other technology. So the essential concept of effect recognition is making a sense of the user interactions, interpreting the sequence of actions, underlining, uh, understanding the associated uh, uh, associated uh, motive, motions, movement, and uh, desires of the human being as far as conducting that specific in user interaction is concerned, interpret that into the specific uh, uh, into the specific patterns into the specific user effect modeling and uh, trying to interpret the sequence of actions to perform the specific uh, emotion capture in other words uh, mapping it with the library of various emotional states to understand what specific specific emotional state the user is going through when we talk of emotional states there are broadly six basic emotional states that we refer to in emotional and intelligence research, these being happiness, sadness, anger, frustration, disgust, and anxiety. These are six emotional states which humans have, uh, uh, which humans exhibit most of the time. And it is uh, important that the future of effective systems, the future of emotional intelligence based systems can detect all these six basic emotional states. So uh, to summarize, a uh, basic EI based effective model consists of these three aspects, effect recognition, effect interpretation and 
affect our reaction. The reaction part not only involves the mapping concept, but it also involves the system reacting in, an, uh, in a way that enhances the user in interaction, that increases the user experience, that increases the trust on technology, and that facilitates seamless communication between the human and the technology. It can be one or more of these factors, but the essence of affect aware reaction is to make sure that the trust, user experience, and associated um, uh, emotional aspect of the uh, user uh, of the activity or the task being uh, performed by the user is enhanced. And we are further going to talk more about some of the specific affect aware reaction cases as we go ahead in this webinar. So to give a brief re review of the existing systems or the existing works that exist in this domain. There have been a range of researchers who have worked on this technology and have been working on this technology in the recent past. One of the essential and one of the common ways of doing research as far as emotion, uh, emotion analysis, emotion recognition, emotion detection in the concept of user interactions is concerned is tracking facial expressions. People have used, um, developed softwares. Microsoft has a uh, Microsoft uh, emotion recognition AI and uh, by using that or by developing similar APIs, people have developed softwares, applications, tools, and products that can track the video data and map various facial expressions to different emotional states. And at the same time, um, people have, uh, researchers have used the red, green, blue data of images to further uh, confirm the emotional um, emotion associated with different user interactions. People have also used speech and audio and visual data for tracking the associated emotions. Machine learning has also been used. Hidden Markov model has been uh, widely used. Conditional random fields and a various other emotional uh, and various other machine learning based concepts have been used for mapping emotions as far as user interactions with a computer are concerned. At the same time, in the field of natural language processing, uh, emotion recognition from text, emotion recognition from tweets, emotion recognition from comments, emotion recognition from Facebook blogs by uh, specifically performing sentiment analysis of the associated text has also been constantly investigated by researchers in this field. Uh, at the same time, emotion recognition from touch-based interactions has also been evaluated and has also been studied by researchers. So to summarize in terms of methodology, the various methodologies can be summarized as facial expressions, video data, voice-based, machine learning, probabilistic-based, touch-based interactions, and text analysis. However, there are multiple uh, drawbacks in terms of uh, these technologies that exist. And that is why at the University of Cincinnati uh, in the multimedia and augmented reality lab, we are taking an interdisciplinary approach to address these limitations. And uh, so uh, basically when we talk of facial expression based emotion analysis, the facial expressions of a user can change based on the geographic location the user is located in. The facial expression of the user can be different based on way, based on uh, any specific disabilities that ha they ha might have, which might limit their abilities in terms of displaying a specific emotion. When we talk of voice-based facial, voice-based emotion analysis, it depends on a number of factors, whether the microphone is working correctly or not, whether how far the user is located from the microphone, whether the user always talks in a high-pitched voice, whether the user always talks in a low-pitched voice. There are multiple limitations. When we talk of uh, sentiment based analysis, like even if we ask the user to take a survey every time they're using an AI-based device or they're using a product or they're using a smart device in the surrounding, it depends on the user's mood. It depends on multiple aspects. It depends on the user's emotion, belief, desire, and intention towards using that specific technology. And always survey results or text-based analysis might not be correct. For instance, if we ask the user to take a survey, multiple factors might affect the, uh, the content they're writing in the survey, and that may or may not be their actual emotional response in terms of using that technology. For instance, if it's a very new technology, the user might not want to say that they are using it for the first time. That is, uh, this is an example of how a preconceived belief and a preconceived notion can affect surveys and can act as a roadblock in terms of uh, emotion analysis and in terms of detecting the emotional aspect of user interactions. Therefore, at, our, uh, at the Multimedia and Augmented Reality Lab, we are taking a holistic approach 
at the intersection of Internet of Things, pervasive computing, assistive technology, machine learning, AI, human computer interaction, human machine interaction to uh, track emotion, to develop emotional intelligence in the future of smart homes so that these smart homes can be assistive, adaptive, aware, uh, and can take proper decisions and uh, take uh, and interact with the user in a seamless way as far as the future of human computer, human machine, and human technology interactions are concerned in smart homes. So to give an overview of why this concept is necessary, so uh, research has shown the effectiveness of body movements in conveying emotions, which is supported by psychology research, facial expression-based emotion recognition ha um, uh, might usually require the user to be present close to the system as well, so that the user comes in the range or comes in the domain of the webcam or com the camera being used by the system. Um, expression of specific emotional states depends on user diversity in terms of the user's geographic location the, um, and multiple aspects related to the user's char character. And at the same time, uh, several research uh, in this field has shown th that body motions, gestures, and postures are important means of portraying nonverbal communications. So we are focusing on uh, uh, harvesting all these aspects of um, user interactions, tracking the same, detecting the same, making, uh, uh, analyzing the same to interpret these um, uh, human behavioral aspects of user interactions to understand the underlying emotional state of the user. So when we talk of smart homes, when we talk of people interacting with computers, machines, systems, robots, uh, in terms of smart homes, it is important to discuss activities of daily living because um, uh, activities of daily living can be broadly summarized as a range of activities that people need to do on a day-to-day -day basis to maintain their sustenance. And activities of daily living are always take place in a smart home or in the living environment of a human being. It could be home, it could be work, or it it could be a specific dwelling environment in which they function, live, and grow on a day-to-day -day basis. And these are an integral aspect of the range of user interaction a user performs on a day-to-day -day basis. There can be multiple definitions of activities of daily living. I'll provide one of the definitions here based on a review paper which we recently authored. So activities of daily living can be broadly summarized as personal hygiene, dressing, eating, maintaining continence, and mobility. So these activities, these uh, there are certain subdivisions of these activities. For instance, when we talk of personal hygiene, it can be showering, grooming. When we talk of eating, it can be eating a specific meal, like eating breakfast, eating lunch, and so on. Mobility could be moving around from one place to the another, uh, other, for instance, to uh, perform personal hygiene-related activities, to, perform, uh, to uh, get proper lunch, to get proper dinner, and so on. And there can be a range of characteristics of um, activities of daily living. These include single sequential activities, Activity, non concurrent and non interleaving multiple activities, interleaving and non concurrent multiple activities, and interleaving and concurrent multiple activities. So, to summarize um, these specific characteristics, these activities of daily living can take place where, as standalone activities, like um, as you can see in figure eight, part A, these activities can take place in a way in which they are interleaving with each other. Like, imagine a user, uh, imagine a person cooking something on the microwave and they get an important phone call and they are talking on the phone call while performing this activity of cooking. It's two activities taking place at the same time. Um, and this is where two activities, are. Uh, this is an example of two activities interleaving with each other. And imagine another example where a uh, user is uh, maybe uh, talking, uh, talking on the phone and all of a sudden they realize that they have something on the gas or they have something on the microwave that they need to take care of immediately. So they would leave the phone in the middle and then they would take care of the microwave. So this is another example where the user is not completing or is probably not completing the current activity they are doing and they are focusing on the second activity at hand based on the temporal and spatial locations of the user and the associated emotion, belief, desire and intention. So based on the specific temporal and emotional aspects of the user and the associated emotion, belief, desire and intention. So this is a model in human computer and uh, in 
interaction in affective wear technology known as EBDI model. Um, so basically based on these two factors, the various char characteristics of activities of daily living, one or more of these characteristics can take place in a seamless manner as far as human technology partnerships are concerned. So uh, there are multiple ways of detecting human behavior. This is one specific framework which we have developed at our lab. So this framework is known as the four layered hierarchical framework for detecting human behavior. So this framework begins at layer one. So it's like a bottom up framework where we begin from the layer one, which is the lo lowest layer. This layer can track the various body motion features and these body motion features involve movement of the arms, movement of the legs, movement of all body parts by using a host of sensor technologies. The specific sensor that we have deployed is the Kinect Microsoft Connect sensor. There can be multiple other sensors as well. It uses the video data, RGB data, and it also provide, provides the black and white data in terms of uh, which allows seamless uh, interpretation of the associated motion of the user. And then we uh, map this behavior into type one and type two behavior. So type one behavior involves movement of the upper body part and type two behavior involves movement of the lower body part. We characterize these motions into individual behaviors. So by individual behaviors, we mean the sequence of motions and the, uh, that makes some sense or uh, that creates some logic into understanding the associated activity of daily living or the associated activities of daily living that are being performed. And finally, the last layer allows us to map social interactions uh, until the, uh, as, at this point, uh, as far as the total research that has been completed on this framework involves that we are able to map two users interacting with each other and performing an activity in collaboration. For instance, two users cooking together, two users lifting a, a table, two users um, uh, deciding to perform, um, let's say, uh, lifting, doing some heavy lifting, like carrying a heavy box or something like that, where uh, two users are not only interacting with each other, but they're also interacting with the technology. So our framework is not only able to understand this human computer, human machine, and human robot interactions, but it is also able to track these interactions that people have with each other in the context of the smart, pervasive, and ubiquitous technologies that surround them. And um, so this is uh, an algorithm which we are uh, which we are going uh, using comprehensively in various um, human behavior recognition related technologies that we have developed. So this is known as the complex activity recognition algorithm. And to give a broad level summary of this algorithm, this algorithm states that the holistic uh, scope of user interactions as far as activities of daily living are concerned can be uh, categorized into atomic activities, complex activities. Atomic activities refer to the fine grain movements, actions, uh, motions, and behaviors that comprise the total activity as a whole. And this total activity as a whole is known as the complex activity. And there are certain other terminologies, for instance, the start atomic activity and the end atomic activity. This, uh, there are associated motions, movements, behaviors, and tasks, or in other words, the atomic activities that are associated with the start of a given complex activity are known as the start atomic activities. Those are atomic activities associated with the end of a given complex activity are known as the end atomic activities. Those specific atomic activities which are crucial for the performance of an activity are known as the core atomic activities. And likewise, the uh, specific activities that are not really very important, but are still there uh, to be performed and known as the other atomic activities. And all the environment parameters, the environmental context, the spatial and temporal features of these activities of daily living on which these atomic activities are performed are known as context attributes. The context attributes associated with the start atomic activities are known as start context attributes. Those associated with the end atomic activity are known as end context attributes. And those associated with the core atomic activities are known as the core context attributes. So uh, this is just a summary of what I just explained, and um, there are uh, there is a concept known as activity threshold function. So these atomic activities, context attributes, core atomic activities, core context attributes are assigned weights as far as each activity of daily living is concerned. And when we track human behavior to understand the underlying emotion, it is important that we map this threshold function. This threshold function defines whether a specific activity is completed or not, whether a specific activity leads to a good 
about user experience or not, whether a specific activity, uh, how a specific acti activity can be further mapped to under understand the underlying um, uh, user experience and the user's emotion. So there are multiple things that go into tracking this activity threshold function, which I'll skip uh, as far as the scope of this webinar is concerned, but I'll, uh, disc uh, I'll point you to that paper, which, which, which can talk further about this activity threshold function. This activity threshold function is basically can at this point can be viewed as uh, as that limit or as that threshold that helps us in detecting whether activity is being performed and based and it's a numerical value which would, is also going to help us understand the associated um, emotional state and the associated uh, affective state which can further be classified into the six basic emotional states of happiness sadness anger frustration disgust and anxiety and we are going to discuss that in the uh, next few slides so when we talk of activity monitoring it's important that um, we have a model, we have a system set up that can uh, use different uh, ways and different manners in terms of tracking the associated motions, making sense of the logical behaviors, putting these behaviors one after the other, comparing it with a definition of behaviors in the system and detecting the specific activity being performed. So we have developed, uh, in addition to the uh, social interaction recognition rela related framework, this is another activity recognition framework that we have uh, developed at our lab, which basically, first of all, creates the definition of, uh, of, of the human activity in terms of uh, different activities of day, in terms of all the different activities of daily living that are concerned, and that can take place in the premises of a given space. And the second layer of the framework leverages these definitions to create a knowledge base of activities of daily living based on the different ways these activities can be performed. By different ways, I mean, uh, uh, depending on user diversity, for instance, uh, based on the user's uh, associated uh, experience with the system, based on the user's knowledge with the system, based on the user's mode, based on how a user prefers doing a specific activity. There can be multiple combinations or multiple ways by which a specific user uh, activity can be performed. For instance, um, uh, uh, if we talk of the simple activity of heating food using a microwave, I can prefer heating a specific food for two minutes, my colleague can prefer hitting a specific food for five minutes, someone else can prefer hitting that same food for 30 seconds. So uh, here's just an example based on how differences in the temporal characteristics lead to different user interaction patterns as far as heating food using a microwave is concerned. And at the same time, it's also important uh, that we realize it's not only the difference in the time associated with the activity, but it's also the way they act as specific activities performed. For instance, if we look at the activity of watching a television, I could prefer watching a sports uh, channel, uh, my colleague could prefer watching uh, a movie channel, and so on. So it's the same device, it's the same unit, it's the same system, but we are performing similar yet different activities. This results from user diversity. The, uh, and users are diverse when we uh, talk of the entire geographic regions, locations, and uh, spaces on Earth is concerned. So it's essential that we develop a system that can track all these minute and major uh, and all forms of variations in user interactions associated with activities of daily living so that the underlying activities can be detected, tracked, and interpreted. In the third layer, we call the third layer the learning layer. This learning layer basically can uh, involves a machine learning model that uses the data from the first two layers to detect the underlying activity with a high level of accuracy. Our layer achieves accuracy of more than 83% on one data set and more than 89% on another data set as far as detecting a wide spectrum of activities of daily living is, are concerned. And, and the fourth layer basically involves the necessary architecture uh, uh, related to its implementation in an IoT based or in a pervasive or ubiquitous environment. So this is just one example of our framework working. So uh, we applied our framework on a data set um, and, uh, and uh, we had different activities like going to bed, preparing breakfast, taking a shower, leaving house, um, uh, storing groceries in the fridge, getting a drink, preparing dinner, getting snacks, and similar activities were performed. So our framework is not only able to detect these activities, 
activities, but it is also able to detect the specific uh, temporal locations, uh, the, the specific spatial locations and temporal characteristics of the user. By temporal characteristics, I mean whether the activity was performed in the morning, afternoon, evening, or night. So we are able to detect all of that when it uh, comes to uh, applying our framework in an IoT-based living environment and detecting these uh, characteristics of user interactions, user behavior in the context of activities of daily living. So one of the application uh, or data science based tools that we have used for developing the third layer or the learning layer uh, specifically and in terms of uh, encompassing all these various characteristics of a framework, uh, the specific software tool that we have used is Rapid Miner. So Rapid Miner is a data science based uh, application development platform that allows seamless development of machine learning um, and similar technologies. And so basically using Rapid Miner, we developed all these layers. We uh, use the random forest based learning approach. The reason behind using random forest was we developed a, we uh, performed a comparative study of different machine learning based approaches. And we found that random forest approach um, is the best suited in terms of performance accuracy, in terms of um, uh, the overall accuracy of detection in terms of the respective class precision values, and in terms of the specific subclass uh, precision values for detection of various activities of daily living in an IoT based environment. And that is why we used random forest for development of this um, model, uh, active, which involves activity recognition by using a four-layered uh, four layered architecture um, that can uh, track not only these activities, but the associated behavior. When um, implemented on a data set, we found that the overall accuracy of the model was 89.06%. And this is the result from another data set where we use the same model. Um, and we found that the overall accuracy was 83.33%. Here, the different activities that we could track were watching TV, using laptop, using subwoofer, using washing machine, cooking in a kitchen, using microwave, and using toaster. The uh, essence of discussing these specific complex activities or activities of daily living um, being that depending on the spatial and temporal uh, circumstances of the user and uh, spatial and temporal components that surround a user, this range of activities of daily living, this range of tasks that a user performs can vary. And as well as that emotion, belief, desire, intention model also comes into play. And upon applying our framework to two different models, we can see that irrespective of the specific activity or irrespective of the activities of daily living that are being performed by the user, our framework can detect those uh, seamlessly with a high level of accuracy. So uh, now we are coming to that aspect where we need to model the exhaustive range of ways or the exhaustive ways by which a specific activity of daily living can be performed. And we draw inspiration from the binomial concept, binomial theorem concept in math mathematics. So I'm not gonna discuss the proof of the binomial theorem, but to give a brief overview, the binomial theorem allows to mathematically model the number of ways of selecting K items from an item set containing N entities, assuming K to be be less than or equal to n without replacement. So we use this concept in our framework to develop uh, multiple equations uh, which have which help to model the holistic range of user interactions uh, by uh, associated with a specific activity of daily living. And these holistic range of user interactions represent the uh, exhaustive set of ways by which any specific activity of daily living can be performed irrespective of user diversity, or in other words, irrespective of the user's emotional state irrespective of the user's belief or desire, emotion, intention towards a specific technology irrespective of their geographic location, irrespective of the experience with technology and irrespective of any factors that affect the human interaction with technology by using this um, uh, these set of mathematical equations that we have developed in our framework by using the binomial theorem of mathematics, we are able to model the range of user interactions uh, that uh, represent uh, the exhaustive set of uh, human behavior that represent the exhaustive set of ways by which a specific activity of daily living can be performed. And uh, so I'm not discussing the derivation of these equations in, in interest of time for this webinar, but I'll uh, show you the paper where you can find the derivation of these user interactions. So uh, to give a very broad level um, um, explanation of our framework, um, working in action, imagine the complex activity of making food using a microwave. 
so uh, on the on table one you can see the associated atomic activities and atomic activities we are referring to atomic activities as uh, uppercase a lowercase t and then the specific activity for instance the first atomic activity could be standing like imagining that the user is seated in some location of the room the user would stand up walk up to the microwave turn on the microwave and perform certain operations so the the specific sub uh, the, so the specific atomic activities involve standing walking towards microwave turning on microwave loading food in bowl and setting the time and so on and the associated context attributes or the environment parameters or the features of the environment on which these atomic activities take place and uh, could be the lights being on the kitchen area the microwave present and so on so these are uh, based on probabilistic reasoning in terms of the spatial and temporal features of that specific activity of daily living being performed by the user and uh, these are specific to the spatial and temporal confines of the user and can uh, differ based on their surroundings and based on their environment this example that i have in this slide is based on one of the data sets that we analyzed by using our framework where this uh, uh, complex activity of making food using microwave was tracked in 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 a circumstance or in an environment as described on table 1 so when we use our model which is known as the knowledge based activity recognition uh, uh, abbreviated as kbase ar when we use that model of analysis of the complex activity of making food um, we can we can come up with these numbers when we apply those equations to this atomic level analysis of the activity so the total number of atomic activities can attract as seven as can be seen on table one the associated number of context attributes are also seven the number of core atomic activities are three and the number of core context attributes are three so these core atomic activities are 84 85 and 86 the those specific atomic activities being loading food uh, in the microwave turning off the microwave and taking out the container in which the food is to be uh, eaten or in which the food is to be served or which is going to be used in the process of serving the food and the associated environmental um, parameters or the components of the environment where this activity is going, is going to take place are known as the core context attributes and the total ways the complex activity can be performed as modeled by a equation is no, known as, as u suffix t so that is 128 the total number of ways by which um, uh, this activity can be performed like u suffix t this also includes failed attempts and this also include false starts so what does a failed attempt represent a failed attempt represents from when the user starts off with the microwave gets confused in the middle gets too scared or feels too frustrated or for any technological uh, issues with the microwave does the user does not end up completing the activity we can detect failed attempts by using the threshold function it also includes false starts for instance let's say the user is cooking on the microwave the user gets an important phone call work or personal phone call and then they have to focus on the phone call more that is why they are not able to complete the activity of cooking using the microwave so this includes a false start so u suffix t basically or u or capital u basically gives us the range of ways this complex activity can be performed including success attempts successful attempts failed attempts and false starts v gives us the total number of ways the end goal can always be met or in other words irrespective of the start irrespective of the circumstantial features irrespective of the parameters surrounding the user irrespective of whatever is going on in the user surrounding the user will always meet the end goal and w represents the total number of ways by which the activity or the end goal would never be met a couple of examples that i just gave that the user starting the activity and for whatever reason not being able to complete it either uh, which constitutes either either as a false start or as a failed attempt and uh, this uh, calculation of uv and w are represented in the previous slide where uh, small x represents the total number of atomic activities small y or lowercase y represents the total number of context attributes uh, lowercase p represents the total number of core atomic activities and lowercase q represents the total number of core context attributes so basically using those equations and applying that to the spatial and temporal features that surround a user when a specific activity of daily living is con uh, being confirmed is being performed we can mathematically model the total number of ways a specific complex activity can be performed which includes failed attempts and false starts which include uh, and uh, once we have that number we can track the specific number of ways the end goal would always be met and we can also track the specific
specific number of ways, the end goal would never be met. So these are just uh, a few examples of our model in action applied to one of the data sets which encompass the complex activity of watching TV. So uh, table one represents one approach of doing this activity. Table two represents another approach of doing this activity. And the difference between table one and table two is that the user performs the uh, so performs atomic activity number six, which is uh, which the user performs in the context of the second table on the slide or table four as far as the entire presentation is concerned and 86 is performed on CT6. But our results experimentation and data analysis has uh, shown that irrespective of whether the user performs 86 on CT6 uh, in, or in other words, this specific atomic activity on the associated context attribute, the overall complex activity always takes place and that is why these come across as two different approaches of completing this activity and uh, that is why the, uh, this atomic activity and its associated context attribute do not co uh, comprise or do not encompass the list of core atomic activities however if the user performs that the user experience increases if the user does not perform that the user still meets the end goal these are just two approaches or two different ways of doing the specific uh, activity of daily living being concerned and here are two different approaches as well. These approaches differ in terms of the, uh, similar to the last couple of examples, these approaches differ in terms of the number of atomic activities and the associated core, um, uh, associated context attributes that are a part of the activity of daily living in terms of the number of uh, atomic activities, in terms of their nature, in terms of their characteristics. The essence of showing these four tables uh, in, the, uh, in the last couple of slides is to show that um, an activity can be performed in multiple different ways. When we mathematically model the example that we saw a couple of slides ago there were just a few number of ways by which a specific activity can be performed but when you model these activities uh, uh, and when you know exactly the specific number of ways of specific uh, atomic activity can always be performed in terms of like if we look at this example on the previous slide there are 128 ways by which this specific activity can be performed out of which 16 attempts will always be successful attempts and 112 attempts will result in failures because of false starts or any other reason for uh, due to which the user could not reach the end goal. By using these mathematical equations, we are able to model all these 128 uh, instances as far as this complex activity is concerned. It is not only limited to this specific complex activity, we can model all this exhaustive set of ways by which a specific activity can be performed when it comes to modeling any complex activity or any activity of daily living in any any given IoT based pervasive or ubiquitous environment. And so basically uh, uh, the specific four examples that I showed in the next few slides were uh, four different instances of successful attempts of the underlying activity of daily living. So what we have done is by using this mathematical model, we have made an exhaustive set of all the ways uh, of all the U, V and W values of all activities of daily living that can be performed in uh, an IoT based environment so that when the user performs a sequence of actions, when the user starts performing certain atomic activities or on the associated context attributes by using this knowledge base, by using this definition, we can interpret, uh, detect, analyze, and infer whether it is going to be a successful attempt, whether the user is going to meet the end goal, or whether irrespective of what the whatever the user does, it's not going to be a successful attempt. Having this exhaustive definition at our end, having this comprehensive analysis of user interactions at our end, having this knowledge base and database at our end related to the specific atomic activities, complex attributes, and the overall at activity of daily living as a whole helps us in detecting, interpreting, studying, and analyzing these features. And so basically I'll uh, skip discussing these specific differences because these differences are one in terms of the number of atomic activities or context attributes being performed or the nature in which the atomic activity or context attribute was performed in. These are just four typical examples to discuss how our model performs in real time or how our model performs on a simulation basis in terms of modeling successful and unsuccessful attempts related to an atomic, uh, related to uh, studying activities of daily living at an atomic context 
activity uh, atomic activity and context attribute uh, level model so now that we are able to track human um, behaviors in terms of the associated motions tasks uh, and behavior and uh, movements it's important that we relate this to emotions so this is another uh, this is these are the results uh, from another paper that we published recently which involves mapping human activities at a joint point level so these joint point movements are uh, and their associated definitions are obtained from the microsoft connect sensor so microsoft connect sensor allows to track multiple uh, data associated with user behavior user movement when it comes to uh, mapping activities of daily living are concerned and there are a total of 20 joint points that can be obtained from the microsoft sensors database and we have assigned these joint points to the skeletal tracking features to create this definition of joint point movements and de uh, and uh, definitions in terms of human behavior and uh, by creating these definitions we have seen that we can explain human behavior at a joint point level for example consider the movement associated with answering a phone based on whether the user is right handed or left handed they could uh, there could be movement between the joint point pairs 647484 63 or 83 here these joint point pairs for instance joint point 6 refers to the left elbow 4 refers to the head 7 represents the left wrist again 4 refers to the head and so basically this set of points that i just said would involve a left handed user or a user who prefers using their left hand for answering a phone if the user prefers their right hand for, for performing this set of movements, the associated joint point characteristics uh, that undergo a change in terms of speed, in terms of distance, and in terms of their overall position would involve uh, changes in the joint point feature, uh, joint point pairs 10, 4, 11, 4, 12, 4, 10, 3, 11, 3, and 12, 3 getting less. So here we are specifically interested in the distance because we're using our activity recognition framework, we are able to track the human behavior. We are able to track the associated movements and now by using this definition of joint point pairs that can be associated with the skeletal tracking at every point uh, of these behavioral patterns we are able to understand the fine grain level user interactions the fine grain level user behaviors in terms of mapping these joint point pairs uh, during different uh, behavioral patterns that are associated with the activity of daily living and so when we are able to map these behavioral patterns and behavioral features associated with activities of daily living, we find that the associated accelerometer and gyroscope data proved to be very helpful in terms of detecting the differences. For instance, if we consider the four common behavioral patterns in terms of lying, um, standing, sitting, walking that are associated with different activities, we have seen that these behavioral patterns exhibit different kinds of data, different kinds of, uh, are associated with different kinds of data features as far as accelerometer and gyroscope sensors are concerned, which are also an integral part of the experimentation that we are currently doing in our lab. And so these are just few examples of the accelerometer and gyroscope data associated with um, different activities of daily living that a person can perform in the kitchen in a given specific simulated IoT-based environment. Environment. This is the data uh, from accelerometer and gyroscope sensors associated with these behavioral patterns for different activities performed in the bedroom. Um, and uh, so I have represented just a few uh, activities in this slide for paucity of space and uh, to, uh, to make sure that the readability of the graph can be uh, is there. And similarly, uh, these are certain. Um, uh, these this is the representation of accelerometer and gyroscope data for these behavioral patterns associated with activities performed in the office. And this is uh, another representation of these activities performed in the toilet region. So basically, the data set. This is the third data set that we analyzed, where based on the geographic, uh, based on the spatial features of the user, there are four specific activities that the user was uh, found to perform frequently as far as activities of daily living were concerned so we limited our analysis towards tracking the associated accelerometer and gyroscope data related the spatial locations in terms of being the office, in terms of being the toilet, uh, office area, and so on. So um, uh, uh, now we are able to track human behavior. We are able to track the fine grain levels of joint point movements. And by mapping the accelerometer and gyroscope data, we are able to detect the differences between those behaviors, interpret the sequential features, uh, sequential patterns between these behaviors, uh, understand the interdependence and interrelationship between these behaviors that not only take place at one, uh, 
spatial location but that also take place at different spatial locations in the confines of the user's living space. So now that we are, have these relations, this interdependence and interrelations of human behavior at a joint point level, at a, a atomic level, at a fine grain level in terms of atomic activities, context attributes are concerned, how do we relate that to emotions? That performs, uh, that is the, uh, that has been uh, the key focus of all this um, experimentation that we have been doing. I'm sorry, that we have been doing for some time. So basically, we are using Colson's relations. So Colson uh, is, uh, uh, is an eminent researcher in this field. And basically, according to their work, these behavioral patterns, these movements of different body parts can be associated with different emotions. For instance, these are just three representations from Colson's paper, which is one of the seminal works in this field, in, uh, in our opinion. So for instance, the, uh, the uh, movements associated with anger can be represented Presented as shown in um, uh, in in the three images. This is this is just a representation of three images. Anger can have various other movements associated uh, as far as the human behavior is concerned, and these movements can be um, uh, have a specific description in terms of how much the head is bent, how much the chest is bent, how much the specific uh, muscle is bent, how much a specific arm or a leg is bent, and based on that, the specific uh, emotional response can be tracked and studied, like anger disgust, fear, sadness, anxiety, happiness, and so on. So, uh, and this data in terms of tracking which body part uh, exhibits a specific um, movement or which body part exhibits a specific uh, change in terms of the associated distance, in terms of the associated speed of movement of, of the sub body parts, uh, uh, we are able to track that. We are using Colson's relations to understand the associated emotional state. So this is an algorithm which we developed basically with this, uh, this was one of the uh, our initial works which we published in 2018. So this algorithm involves development of an emotion function. So the emotion function begins with basically tracking whether the activity was successful or not. It uses the threshold feature value, threshold function value, and at the same time, it compares whether the start atomic activity was different from the end atomic activity, and then it evaluates all the associated atomic activities and core at uh, atomic activities, core atomic activities, context attributes, and core context attributes to map the sequence in which the different behaviors took place. It, uh, it tracks the associated temporal information. It tracks the associated behavior. It tracks the joint point movements. And it performs a broad classification of the emotion in terms of the positive emotion or the negative emotion. So type 1 is referred to as the positive emotion. Type 2 is referred to as the negative emotion. So the, uh, in this work, we basically uh, uh, classified uh, human behavior in terms of positive or negative emotion. And for sequential activities, our uh, are program or our software would basically call this emotion function for multiple times as long as the sequence of activities continued uh, you know, by having a specific logic and by having a specific order. So this is an improvement on that algorithm that we published in 2019. Uh, so basically, this algorithm is able to extend the previous version of the algorithm and helps us in modeling the various six uh, emotional states that I discussed in the beginning of this webinar, those six basic emotional states being happiness sadness, anger, frustration, disgust, and anxiety. At the same time, we are able, also able to model the emotional state of uh, the user showing a neutral emotion. And this is just a, a pseudocode or a, a basically a broad level representation of the algorithm, uh, when, which we use to develop the specific software application API or API that helps in modeling these specific emotional states based on the associated characteristics of human behavior, based on the associated atomic and subatomic activities based on the associated context attributes, based on the associated complex activities, when studied through the lens of uh, skeletal uh, tracking, when studied through the lens of changes, interrelations, and interdependence between different body parts in terms of the associated accelerometer and gyroscope data, in terms of the direction, speed, and movement of different joint points, and by mapping, tracking, and interpreting all this data that is associated with user interactions, we are able to um, track these associated um, emotional states uh, in terms of different activities of daily living that a user performed in the confines of their given environment. So these are some more results which uh, show our algorithm uh, in uh, action. So this, uh, this uh, figure represents multiple instances of complex activities of the uh, 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 
uh, of specific activities such as sleeping, showering, eating breakfast, leaving for work, and so on, analyzed over a 24 hour period from the given data set where different activities are represented by color coding. Uh, and this is uh, the representation of one of those activities where multiple activities, uh, where multiple instances of that activity were tracked to be taking place at the same time. Uh, because as I discussed, the temporal information is also important in detecting uh, the associated information as uh, that was the first uh, that was a part of the first algorithm which cl broadly classifies the associated emotion as positive or negative so uh, uh, we tracked multiple instances of the activity of daily living in terms of the watching tv from that data set and we found that there's a pattern in terms of where the this activity in terms of the temporal information of how this activity is performed and similarly our algorithm is able to track monitor and interpret the specific temporal features or the temporal characteristics in terms of determining whether there's a sequence, whether there's a pattern, whether there's a repetition, or whether there's a logic in terms of how this uh, complex activity takes place on a 24-hour period or when analyzed over a 24-hour period. And on table seven, you can see the joint point level inter uh, analysis of this complex activity. That's a different complex activity, eating lunch, which was found to be uh, taking place at certain um, points during the 24-hour period. And um, the joint point features that that are being studied in this context refer to the joint point distance, the joint point speed, and the joint point characteristics as a whole undergoing uh, one or more changes. So here you have the analysis of the atomic activity, the context attribute, and the joint point pairs that undergo a change. And based on this, based on the third column, we're able to apply Coulson's relations, both our algorithms, to detect the associated emotional state in terms of first classifying the activity as positive or negative emotion, and then breaking it or dividing it into the basic emotional states like happy happiness, sadness, anger, frustration, disgust, and anxiety, and at the same time detecting if the associated emotion was a neutral emotion. So uh, here you have some more results where uh, uh, table eight shows a typical uh, activity, uh, occurrence of a typical uh, complex activity performed by a typical user in, in the confines of their given environment and the overall inference of our algorithm. This is the inference from the first algorithm, which shows that the overall emotional uh, response of the user was positive uh, as far as that activity of watching TV at a specific time instance was concerned. In all these tables, the numbers that you see next to the atomic activities, next to the complex activities, next to the context attributes are the specific weights that help in determining the overall threshold function. For instance, the threshold function for the complex activity of watching TV is 0 0.67. This is the function of all the weights of the atomic activities, of all the weights of the context attributes, of all the weights of the core atomic activities and core context attributes, as well as the start atomic activities, start uh, 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 context attributes, end atomic activities, and end context attributes, like all the rows of the table taken together. And there's a mathematical formula that helps us in determining the overall um, threshold function of any given complex activity. This threshold function is different for different complex activities in terms of its numerical value. And uh, so basically, uh, this threshold function helps in determining, one, whether the user, uh, user successfully completed that activity, uh, how the user completed that activity, whether the user performed all the associated interactions and the extent or the degree to which the activity was properly performed. This analysis and this interpretation of um, the user's actions, of the user's behavior and the user's tasks associated with the complex activity helps us in determining, in addition to the uh, detecting on the overall completion of activity, helps us in determining the associated user experience the, and the user's emotion based on whether the activity was completed or not. And in table nine, you can see different um, uh, time instances of the day were associated with different complex activities uh, for the typical day that we are analyzing. And these results are taken from our paper, which I'm going to uh, point uh, towards the end of my presentation. So basically, uh, we have a specific time. We have a specific activity that the user is performing at that specific time. And our algorithm, based on this fine grain behavior level, joint point level, atomic level, and context attribute, uh, and context attribute level analysis of human behavior, it is able to classify the overall emotion as positive or negative based on studying all these factors, including the joint point uh, analysis and where joint points are tracked for change in distance, speed, and their overall characteristics. 
So this is the rapid minor process once again, where we used a, a random model, a random forest-based um, learning classifier for developing the system that classifies um, the overall emotion uh, of associated with the activity by studying the joint point analysis of human behavior. This is a different rapid minor system. All the rapid minor systems that I have uh, discussed in this uh, webinar are different, but we have consistently used random forest model. And the reason behind using that was um, we performed a, comp uh, a comp comprehensive case study of including multiple machine learning models where we performed that uh, where we found that the random forest model outperforms um outperforms the other machine learning models or machine learning classifiers in terms of uh, performance accuracy, um, subclass precision values, and overall uh, uh, and overall accuracy of the model. That is why all the rapid minor models or the rapid minor systems that I have displayed and, and uh, discussed in this webinar have the random forest based uh, classifier. So this is uh, a screenshot of this model in action, which um, uh, also discusses, uh, which also shows the overall mood of the user, that is the associated emotion of the user. And basically, uh, we also classify the user experience as uh, positive or negative. So this user experience being uh, a direct function of the associated emotional response of the user after completing the activity. So as you can see, the rapid minor model assigned a certain confidence value to this user, uh, uh, to, to the overall emotional response in terms of positive or negative emotion. So it's, we are not only detecting the overall positive or negative emotion, but we are also detecting it with a certain degree of confidence. A model is able to say directly that it is confident to, for instance, 82%, 72%, 28%, uh, or uh, uh, or if we look randomly at a specific uh, row, for instance, if we look at row number 10, where um, uh, basically the prediction is positive, uh, but the actual, uh, actual uh, emotional response was negative and that is why the confidence of the model was 62% for uh, a positive response and 38% for a negative response so when the uh, the confidence level comes near to uh, near to the 50% range then the uh, then the associated positive or negative uh, emotional responses uh, this interpretation and this detection and this prediction can slightly differ but when you look at another row for instance row number 14 um, the overall um, um, overall emotion displayed by the user was positive the prediction was positive positive and that is why uh, and that can also be seen from the confidence level of our model our model was 72.7 percent confident in terms of detecting the overall uh, in terms of detecting the overall um, uh, mood of the user detecting the overall emotional response of the user so if we look at the performance accuracy of this model you can see that the model achieved a performance accuracy of 73.13 percent when uh, applied on one data set these are just results from application of the model on one data set so uh, we applied the model to two different data sets as well and we consistently found that the results uh, reach a very high level of accuracy in terms of detecting the overall emotional state uh, and classifying it as a positive or a negative emotion so these are uh, the publications that have resulted um, uh, based on our work related to development of emotional intelligence in smart homes so we have since 2018 we have authored 28 publications in this field by uh, exploring the intersections of internet of things human computer interaction machine learning, AI, pervasive computing, ubiquitous technology to create uh, and develop systems, applications, and technologies that can facilitate the seamless interaction between humans, computers, machines, and robots so that these two or multiple entities can perform, interact, coordinate, and collaborate with each other in the future of AI based, in the future of machine learning based, in the future of assistive smart homes so that basically when these two entities co coordinate, collaborate, and interact with each other, the overall user experience increases, the overall trust on technology increases, the overall dependence on technology increases, the overall acceptance on technology increases, resulting the, in the fact that human beings can perform uh, seamlessly uh, in smart home environments. Human beings can have increased uh, emotional uh, uh, responses, better emotional responses of interacting with technology. They can experience enhanced, uh, they can uh, enjoy better user experiences while interacting with technology. And at the same time, the info graphic that I displayed in the beginning, that infographic is likely going to change. That infographic showed that most people do not trust technology that much, but we believe that uh, based on the uh, applications, products, systems, and technologies that we have already developed and which we 
are developing and which we plan on implementing in real time very soon, that infographic is going to change. That infographic is expected to show uh, a different pattern in terms of making sure that people um, are trusting technology even more. People are trusting technology way more than they did in the past because the objective is to create uh, uh, high levels of trust between humans and the technologies and the systems that they interact with. Uh, interact with interact with in smart home environments to make sure that uh, human computer, human machine, and human system interactions can take place in a seamless manner so that both these entities can enjoy independent and uh, cohabited living in the future of living, functioning, and working environments which involve smart homes. So basically, to conclude, uh, it's, an, it's, essentially, uh, it's essential at this point uh, in view of uh, the wide-scale expansion of smart cities and adoption of smart cities at different parts of the world that we develop emotional intelligence using effective technologies for assisted living. And we can, uh, we can reach assisted living by uh, improving the overall health, well-being of the individual living in smart homes with a specific focus on improving the mental and emotional well-being of the user because mental and emotional well-being has been found to play key roles in terms of uh, ensuring the health, longevity, and independent living of any individual with a specific focus on elderly people because quite often in different geographic locations, elderly people are forced or have to stay alone. And so basically, uh, we discussed the need for developing emotional intelligence. We started off with discussing uh, how emotional intelligence means to us at a human level, at a human human interaction level, and how we can expand that de definition of interpersonal relationships into developing strong, uh, tangible, and seamless relationships of humans with technology, humans with computers, humans with machines, and humans with systems so that these two entities can enjoy uh, constant co coordination, interaction, collaboration, and, uh, uh, and can live together in the future of smart, uh, ubiquitous, and pervasive environments such as smart homes and smart cities. We discussed the recent works in this field and we identified the limitations of these works. For instance, the limitations in facial expression-based analysis, the limitation in sentiment uh, uh, recognition performed on te text data, the limitations in the way uh, certain other technologies function and we discussed that the need to perform human behavior-based uh, uh, analysis, human behavior-based systems that can develop emotional intelligence in the future of living, working, and functioning environments. We discussed, uh, we basically, we, that is why we at the University of Cincinnati in a multimedia and augmented reality lab, we have been developing emotional intelligence-based uh, technologies through the lens of human behavior detection, analysis, modeling, and interpretation that includes the methodology to model diverse user interactions interactions arising from user diversity. And when we can model this, we can map that to different emotional states. Our system is able to detect the six basic emotional states uh, like happiness, sadness, anger, frustration, disgust, and anxiety. At the same time, it is able to model uh, emotions at a broad level, uh, as a broad level classifier by classifying emotions as positive or negative. And at the same time, uh, uh, we have also developed the methodology of analysis of affective states or uh, emotional states associated with human behavior during different activities of daily living in a smart home. We have applied our technology to multiple data sets and the results are highly promising and we are working on real-time deployment and development of these technologies in a way uh, so that uh, we can not only implement that in one smart home, but we can also implement that in interconnected smart homes so that these smart homes of the future in the interconnected smart cities can coordinate and collaborate with each other in terms of, of using the machine associated machine learning models so that we can facilitate distributed learning and uh, of smart homes together where all these smart homes learn user behavior together, understand user behavior together, interpret user behavior together, and can facilitate an overall machine learning AI and uh, intelligent community, which would involve an intelligent assisted living smart city or assisted living community where the different dwelling units, smart homes or smart uh, living uh, places can coordinate, collaborate, and seamlessly communicate with each other. So basically, these are uh, the other references for, for this presentation, which uh, do, do not include our publications, but certain papers which uh, I uh, discussed are the certain, um, uh, uh, basically the recent research that has been done in this field, and at the same time, some of the other works like the complex activity recognition algorithm and so on. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. So. 
uh, that is my website, that is my LinkedIn and email. I would be happy to answer any questions that any one of you might have and you can connect me, uh, connect with me on my website, on my LinkedIn and um, shoot me any questions via email. So thank you once again um, uh, to everyone for this invitation of delivering this webinar. And I look forward to staying in touch and I would be happy to answer any and all questions that you might have. Thank you once again. Extremely thankful we are for delivering this webinar. Thank you very much. Any questions from our audience side? Uh, yeah, free to write in chat box. Yes, we are waiting. Somebody going to write. Raise your hand. Okay, meanwhile, we receive some questions, sir. Uh, we would like to know that according to you, what are the contemporary challenges which are coming in the field of like, however, many of the things we have highlighted, but uh, what things are there where uh, we have to make a balance in our, uh, like everyone talking about smart cities, smart homes, mm -hmm. isn't it? But they, uh, they, we have some security issues as well, privacy concerns also involved in this part, right? So do you think this, this uh, uh, our new researchers will able to cope with this scenario? I mean, security well, issues and privacy issues? Absolutely, that is an excellent question. So uh, thank you for asking that question because uh, security in smart homes is something which definitely concerns the user adaptation, user acceptance of technology. And people are always concerned how their data is being used, how, uh, how the smart devices are using their data, whether their data is being compromised. So in my opinion, proper training awareness about technology is necessary. That is not exactly my field like security uh, uh, of, human, uh, of user interaction data, but um, based on my understanding and based on my knowledge in this field, I, I strongly believe that proper awareness about technology is necessary because I have spoken to users who do, do not use Google Maps on their phone because they are concerned that Google might sell their information, which is true. That is uh, wrong information. That is wrong belief. That is wrong uh, desire to, uh, that a person has. That is a wrong preconceived notion that a person has towards the technology. So that is wrong. So in my opinion, proper training and awareness about technology is essential. So whenever we are implementing a smart technology in the living space of a user, uh, I strongly believe that it's important that the user is made aware of how that data is used because uh, when the user is aware that the data is confined to the specific smart home or the data is stored on a secure local uh, area network or a wide area network or maybe uh, uh, higher modes of security can be achieved by using a blockchain based network because blockchain is highly secure blockchain based communication in terms of human computer interaction blockchain based analysis of user interaction data there can be multiple models that can be applied but one of the ways of uh, essentially ensuring the security of uh, user data could be uh, first developing systems in a way that the user data is not compromised and at the same time developing systems in a way where the users or the end users of these systems are made aware um, of how their data is being used so that users do not have their wrong beliefs or wrong preconceived notions affect their adaptation or acceptance of the associated technology. Right, right, I agree. Okay, uh, any other question? So Nirmalaya, we would like to know about you, uh, uh, your journey from uh, India to University of Cincinnati, from where you belongs to and what was your academic journey so far? Can you brief about all these things? Absolutely. So basically, um, like, uh, I mean, um, so I completed my bachelor's in India, and then I came to the University of Cincinnati after completing my bachelor's and after com uh, I, uh, to complete my graduate degree. So I completed my master's uh, at the University of Cincinnati, and currently I'm working here as an instructor. I teach a couple of courses. Um, so basically, uh, programming for EC and computer science one, those are basically uh, introductory computer science courses in our department, the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer science. I'm associated with the multimedia and augmented reality lab as a human computer interaction researcher. And um, uh, like since coming to the University of Cincinnati, I have been uh, focusing on the area of human computer interaction research. And that is why all the publications that I just displayed um, have been my publications that I have published since I started my journey at the University of Cincinnati. And um, I believe we have uh, like multiple uh, departments, multiple um, divisions of uh, University of Cincinnati are working 
related to smart homes, related to um, human computer interaction. We have a uh, school of IT that has uh, specific uh, human computer interaction groups, human centered com computing research is going on um, really well over there. And at the same time, cybersecurity research is also being taken up uh, by the school of IT as well as by our department. So we are focusing on, uh, so the, uh, uh, doing research in different uh, emerging topics in different emerging fields that um, contribute towards in, uh, enhanced health well-being um, of individuals um, towards creating a better future in terms of technology-based future where uh, technology can contribute towards enhancing lives, enhancing user experience, um, and um, uh, uh, and basically creating the difficult and complex things easy in terms of different, different application domains, not only in smart homes. Smart homes is the specific focus of my research, but there are other groups. For instance, we have multiple research groups over here that's focus on smart industries, smart cars, automated driving, and so on. So we have wide research groups. Uh, we collaborate with each other. We uh, also work with each other. And at the same time, we have our specializations as well. Like my specialization is HCI, ubiquitous technology assisted living in smart homes. So basically, uh, we are, um, are doing research on various um, applications, we are on various um, on various industries or various uh, topics that would contribute towards making the future of tomorrow uh, uh, for humanity a better future for uh, people to live, work, and grow. That is what, what we are do doing because at University of Cincinnati, we believe that the next lives here, that the next generation of uh, scientists, that the next generation of uh, creators, that the next generation of people who go on to invent the big things uh, in the world lives here. That is one of the things that we are focusing on. So that is a mission, the next lives here mission. So that is what we are focusing on. That is is what we always believe and that is what uh, every researcher believes that uh, the next lives here the next is uh, a part of here at the uc community and together we are going to make humanity uh, better in terms of creating a better world for humanity to live work and grow that is what all our research groups focus on and that is uh, 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 just a very brief level explanation of the next lives here mission you can uh, look up online next lives here university of cincinnati and that's going to give you further details of the next lives here mission of University of Cincinnati. Okay, okay, that's, that's pleased to uh, know about your journey and your what happenings are there in USA Cincinnati University. Okay, uh, I think we don't have any questions. And uh, on the fraternity of LBF academics, teaching staff, faculties, and non teaching staff as well students, on the behalf of all the uh, people, member of LBF family, we are really obliged to uh, host you as a webinar, right? And thank you very much for joining, for sharing your thoughts and views for uh, such a wonderful topic and the things which we are, uh, which, which is very contemporary for nowadays. Uh, this health monitoring system, a smart monitoring system uh, are, are the need of time, especially the corona has taught us so many lessons. And this is also one of the important lessons that we have to invest in the healthcare sector and SCI, AI, ML are the, are, are the things where uh, uh, our human life totally depends on in coming years. Thank you very much for joining us again. And we, we wish to uh, welcome you board for the, uh, as a guest speaker for coming sessions as well. We will be in touch with you for some sessions for our student. We also have SCI module in our bachelor level degree from Malaysia. So we will we will uh, invite you for some guest lectures for them students also as well right it would be pleasure to host you again if require if uh, the uh, opportunity comes up absolutely yes. i'd be happy to talk to your students i'd be happy to um more about my research and I understand in the scope of this webinar in uh, considering the limitations of time I could not touch uh, take a deep dive in all the technologies so I would love to talk more about that in upcoming lectures while interacting with more of your students right right thank you thank you very much sir thank you very much for joining uh, audience thank, you, thank so you, much. you very much for joining thank you very much have a nice day thank you so much thank you everyone